In the last video, we saw Napoleon's army get decimated, especially as they tried to retreat from Russia. The numbers I threw out in that video is he started off with on the order of 450,000 soldiers under his command. And then when he retreated, it was on the order of 10,000 soldiers. And I just want to take a little aside here. These numbers aren't firm. Historians aren't even sure on the exact numbers. And sometimes you'll see accounts of 500 to 600,000 entering and 30 to 40,000 leaving. I went with these numbers just because on Menard's map, these were pretty close to those numbers. Right here, he has 422,000 leaving. He has 10,000 right there. But I just want to make sure you realize that these aren't exact numbers. And depending on, I guess, how you account for his troops, whether you're talking about troops directly under Napoleon's command, whether there are troops that are directly involved in the offensive invasion of Russia, or they're just troops that are maybe supporting it, you're going to get different numbers. And depending on whether you view you know, troops and how you count the casualties. So it's all about how you count. But needless to say, his the, 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 the French Grand Army was decimated after invading Russia. And I even told you at the end of the last video that after that, the rest of Europe, the, the, these, the other countries that kept forming and reforming coalitions against Napoleon began to smell blood. So you already have, you can already view the invasion of Russia as the beginning of the Sixth Coalition. You already had Great Britain. Great Britain throughout this entire time period, throughout the Napoleonic Wars, was, and even during the French Revolution, was in a constant state of war with the French and Napoleon. Obviously, you have Russia now. Russia now is also going to is, is also a, a, a belligerent, is also an antagonist against Napoleon. They, you know, just because he retreated doesn't mean the war with Russia is over. Prussia had been humiliated multiple times by Napoleon, and now they jump. They jump on the bandwagon after seeing, after hearing about Napoleon getting decimated. And so they a combined Russian and Prussian forces engage Napoleon. But as as much as Napoleon's forces seem to have gotten decimated, so if you look at that Menard map up here that we went over in some detail in the last video. That covers right here. The invasion of Russia started right about here, and it went right about in that direction right there. So Napoleon, he's now retreating back. And you might say, gee, he only has 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 troops. That's nothing. He's just going to be you know, put out uh, very quickly by the combined allied forces. But Napoleon, as you know, we, we kind of say, regardless of what you think of him as a person, he was no dummy. And he was good at raising forces. And he was a very, very, very good military tactician. He was very quickly able to raise, to take his 30,000 soldier army, get it to 130,000. And eventually, he's able to get it to 400,000. Although this force right here, it's not going to be the same quality of 400,000 as the 400,000 that he might have had, say, entering the Russian campaign. And there are other troops also that were allied with Napoleon, German troops from the Confederacy of the, Tr of the Rhine that were sympathetic to the French Empire. But once again, they weren't as disciplined or under as direct control of Napoleon. But it's need you know, needless to say, he was able to very quickly very quickly get up to some reasonable force that could maybe, maybe withstand a sixth coalition. But the sixth coalition was much larger. It's on the order of, so depending on the account you look at, the sixth coalition. They amassed forces mainly in what's now Germany, but at that time the Confederation of the Rhine, and before that the Holy Roman Empire, of on the order of 1 million troops. Uh, not $1 million, one million, 1 million soldiers. So even though Napoleon was able to raise a force, he was still outnumbered in, the, in what's now Germany or in the Germanic kingdoms. He was still outnumbered by a factor of 2 to 1. But despite that, the first several engagements with the combined Russian and Prussian army, Napoleon was victorious. Or I shouldn't say victorious, because that implies too much. He, he won those battles. And these are at Lautzen. Lautzen, Lautzen at Bautzen. And then at Dresden, he had a very significant victory. Dresden. And these are all right about here, just so you have a sense of the geography. You can actually see Dresden on the map there. And after these defeats, 
the 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 coalition said, "Gee, you know this Napoleon character. Even though we outnumber him, even though he he had to kind of very quickly uh, get these troops, he's a really good military tactician, and he's still kind of kicking our butt on the battlefield." They then issued what's called the let me write this down the Trackenberg Plan. Trackenberg Plan. Although it's not clear that they really had to, the Trackenberg Plan, which essentially says, "Try not to engage forces that Napoleon is." in command of directly try to engage his uh, people that Napoleon has had to delegate to his marshals the other generals so don't engage Napoleon one day I'd like to make more detailed videos on the actual kind of you have to say the actual genius of Napoleon on the battlefield and go battle by battle and see why people consider Napoleon to be a great military co- commander but his enemies definitely appreciated the fact that despite being outnumbered he was very tricky and very wily and was always able to a kind of a, a snatch a victory from defeat so they had this plan to say hey let's just not engage Napoleon we have so many troops let's just try to uh, uh, m- in incur losses on the French uh, on other commanders other than Napoleon. But needless to say they hugely they hugely outnumbered hugely outnumbered the French. All of the fighting was going on all of the fighting was going on in this general area at the time. And at Leipzig and just so you get a sense of time, remember the the invasion of Russia was at the end of 18 so let me write this down. So the Russian invasion so Russia, let me just in another color, let me do it right here. So the Russian invasion, that was at the end, end of 1812. It was really kind of the beginning of winter in 1812 that really decimated Napoleon's troops. Then in, then we go to 1813. You're looking at Lautzen and Bautzen. Lautzen and Bautzen. That's in May, May of 1813. So after the uh, that winter, that gave Napoleon some time to get his troops together. And things happen slower at this day and age. People didn't have perfect intelligence uh, in terms of what was going on on the battlefield, and it, it it actually took time for just information to travel and and for armies to travel. They were traveling mainly on foot at that time. And then August 1813. August August you had Napoleon's significant victory at Dresden at Dresden but then finally 1813 1813 in October and at this point the coalition had convinced Austria to also join in. So this is kind of the ultimate coalition. If you look at most of the coalitions, they seldom had both Austria and Prussia and Russia and all of these guys, but now they're all piling on. So now you have Austria. Austria is part of the coalition. And Sweden. And of course, you can't forget what's happening in the Iberian Peninsula. You have all of the rebels in Spain and Portugal. So you pretty much have Every major power in Europe is now allied against Napoleon. And in October of 1813, especially the Austrians, Prussians, and Russians, they meet him at Leipzig. They meet him at Leipzig, which is right over here. And at Leipzig, they outnumber him two to one, and they were able to take care of him and force him to retreat. So then Leipzig happens. First really major defeat. This is actually an image of the Battle of Leipzig. They call it the Battle of the Nations. Battle of Nations. Because so many people were, so many uh, uh, belligerents were involved in this battle. People estimate that there were 600,000 600,000 soldiers involved, 400,000 on the side of the Sixth Coalition, 200,000 on the side of Napoleon, and they estimate on the order of 100,000 dead, dead or wounded. So this was a major, major, super bloody battle, and it forced Napoleon to retreat. So he had to retreat from Russia before, and now he's retreating from the Confederation of the Rhine, which was essentially French-controlled territory. So Napoleon is really on his heels. He now is going to defend France. And now remember, at the same time of this, you had you had all of this stuff going on in the peninsula. You had Arthur Wellesley. You remember him right here. That's Arthur. Arthur Wellesley. 
He's the British general leading, you could view them as the rebels in Spain and Portugal. At the end of 1813, he's winning a series of victories against the French, and he's pushing into France. This is the Pyrenees Mountains right here. He's crossing. He's, he's winning a series of battles in the Pyrenees. And then in the last-ish effort, and Napoleon, once again, he's hugely outnumbered. He starts. He engages his enemies in battles in northeast France, right around that area. And there's actually a period, there's like this, the Six-Day Campaign. And this, now we are in 1814. So that was, Leipzig was at the end of 1813. He retreats, now we're in 1814. And the beginning of 1814, in February, you have the Six-Day Campaign. Six-Day campaign. And this was kind of Napoleon's final shot at really showing his military genius. Despite the fact that he was hugely outnumbered, there were four significant battles where he was essentially able to, at least in those battles, rout the coalition, despite being hugely outnumbered. So he kept showing his military genius. But at some point, the numbers just became overwhelming, and the French troops just couldn't handle the coalition, especially being decimated after being decimated in Russia, and then losing significant troops, uh, even in some of their victories victories in what what is now Germany or the Confederation of the Rhine then and then the the allies the coalition eventually in March in March of 1814 March the sixth coalition or we could say the coalition marches into Paris they march into Paris and this right here is an image of the Russians marching into Paris Russians march into Paris around the time, around March of 1814. But Napoleon didn't want to give up. In April, in April, Napoleon's telling his generals, let's go, let's go retake Paris. But finally, the generals are ready to give up on Napoleon, and they refuse to follow him. And Napoleon says, hey, you know, then I'm going to tell the troops to follow me. And then they're just like, well, you could try, but they're not going to follow you. So they essentially don't agree to do anything that Napoleon wants. Forcing Napoleon, and you know it was going to happen one way or the other. This way is just less bloody. In April of 1814, super important time in history, Napoleon is forced to abdicate. Napoleon is abdicates, and not only does he abdicate, he's you know I won't maybe I'll do a future video on it, but he also has to rescind any claim that any of his his um, his his uh, you know his son or any of his future uh, 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 what's the not the word ancestors what's the opposite of ancestors descendants any of his future descendants might have cla claim as emperor of France or or king of France so he's forced to abdicate future super important time 1814 so if you think about when Napoleon ruled remember he had the whole he he was able to take power at the end of 1799 so it's been on the order of 13 or 14 years where Napoleon has just uh, been the absolute ruler of France and has been able to really kind of wreak a lot of havoc on Europe. And now it all comes to an end. And we'll see it's kind of temporary now, but it's we're, we're getting near the end of, of hearing about Napoleon. They force him to abdicate by the Treaty of Fontainebleau. Treaty of Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau. And they exile him to Elba. So this is just so you know where Elba is, a little island off the Italian coast right here. This is Elba. This is where Napoleon was forced to stay. doesn't seem like that bad of a place. And they actually let him keep the title of emperor, and they allowed him to rule over Elba. And he was actually able to do some reasonably constructive things with the island. You're going to see he leaves the island very shortly. But it wasn't that bad. I mean, you know, in, in modern days, if someone was indirectly responsible or directly responsible for butchering m millions of your civilians or soldiers, you wouldn't send them to a nice, you know, a, a place with a nice climate and give them a nice house like this and, and allow them to actually rule over the island. But I, I think at this time, all of these generals and kings, they all viewed them as you know they all they all had they all viewed each other as gentlemen and they never wanted to uh, be too too vicious to each other just in case the um, uh, things were to come back around to them I guess but he got exiled to Elba in as I just said what was it April of 1814 and then the coalition we'll talk more about this 
They put Louis the Sixteenth. You remember Louis the Sixteenth with the whole French Revolution and the Estates General. They put his younger brother. They restore him to the crown. They, this is right here. Is Louis? This is Louis the Eighteenth. X V I I I. This is Louis the Sixteenth's younger brother. The younger brother. They make him king of France. So I had all that business about the French Revolution. Then Napoleon comes to power and all of these, the rights of man and all of that. When everything's said and done, they put a king back in power. This guy with the satin robes again doesn't look too different than his older brother. And just in case you're wondering, you know, his older brother is Louis the 16th. He is Louis the 18th. Who was Louis the 17th? This is Louis the 17th. Right here. That is Louis the 17th. Louis the 17th. This is Louis the 16th son. He was actually next in line to the throne before his uncle or Louis the 16th's younger brother, Louis the 18th. But he died. He was kind of, you know, while he was in prison, if you are a royalist, you would have considered him king after the uh, after the beheading, the decapitation of his dad. And actually there's a hugely fascinating story here where people they say that he died in 1795, but m many many people think that he escaped and uh, was able to live a normal life and uh, you know, who knows what. But needless to say, he wasn't anywhere to be found. So they made Louis the 18th, Louis the 16th younger brother king of France. But we're going to see this isn't the last we hear of Napoleon.